ship on my way to Mars on a collision course. I am a satellite. I'm out of control. I'm to teaching mode shortly. Oh, okay. Okay. We're all ready. Yep. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, the podcast for this week, which is in week uh, well, six or seven, I can't remember right now, which is week six. And if I'm wrong, I'll edit in week seven. Uh, <laughs> um, well, no, because if you try to edit a tight sentence, it's really hard. But if you just say it really abruptly, I just had the syllabus up, I should look. But anyways, uh, this week's podcast, I'm joined by some lunar experts, uh, also friends of mine, because it's hard to book people these days. Everyone's overbooked uh with with assignments or 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 podcasts or guest lectures or anything like that so uh, i turned to good old friends and i'm fortunate enough to have many friends in the space exploration world so what we're going to be doing today is a little bit different um it's kind of a stupid silly slash fun idea i came up with to kind of go over some of the major historical missions that have explored the moon um and what i'm going to have two colleagues do is a mission draft and we'll explain the rules for that shortly but first I'll introduce everyone who's here um, so in terms of geographic proximity I'll go furthest to closest which I think would be Patrick should be the furthest from me geographically uh, yep. so Dr. Patrick Hill currently operating out of the University of Alberta in Edmonton Alberta uh, Patrick, give them a little bit about yourselves and your uh, experience studying the moon. Yeah, so I did my PhD at the University of Western Ontario. Uh, I looked at uh, the origin of the moon, so how it formed. Um, if you know anything about that, there's this body called Fea that smashed into the earth and formed the, through an impact we got our moon. Um, so I looked at isotopes looking at that. I also looked at Luna Breches. Uh, and now at the U of A, I do research looking at curation. Uh, so how do we um, set hold rocks that we return from these different missions without contaminating them with terrestrial stuff? Uh, and that also includes work. I've done a little work with people out of NASA Johnson who are part of the Artemis and looking at how are we going to return future moon rocks to the Earth and how are we going to do anything different? Excellent. And thank you. While you were doing that, I was setting up a secondary recording device. Um, as our well, the last person I'll introduce knows well, uh, resilience is important in space engineering. And for this podcast, I wanted a backup in case the Zoom recording fails. So I have my phone trying to pick up the, if, that, if that's what I end up using, it'll be terrible audio, but it'll work. Um, next closest to me geographically would be one Dr. Zach Morse. Uh, Zach's actually going to be today's judge, uh, and he's kind of well-placed to do so as a lunar scientist, but who uh, has a fair amount of experience uh, on missions as well, so he'll know the engineering side to an extent. Dr. Morris, why don't you tell us about your history of looking at the moon? All right. Uh, yep, I'm Zach Morris. I'm currently a postdoc with Howard University in Washington, D.C., uh, and I work with NASA Goddard over in Greenbelt, Maryland. I also did my Ph.D., at Western. Uh, and for my PhD thesis, I studied uh, the lunar surface, made a bunch of geographic geologic maps of uh, large impact basins on the lunar surface. And now I work with a team who are uh, preparing instruments and concept of operations for use 
on future astronaut deployments to lunar surface. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, and last but not least, our other contestant for the day, uh, nearest to me, because he's just uh, probably about a mile away or a kilometer, as they say in science, Dr. Matthew Cross. Uh, Dr. Cross, why don't you tell us about your own moon history? All right. Hi. So I'm uh, I'm Matt Cross. Um, I uh, I did I also did my PhD at Western. Um, uh, though I have a, an engineering background, so my background is in aerospace engineering. Uh, and then I was part of the uh, collaborative uh, uh, program at Western in uh, planetary science and exploration. Uh, my main research background is in uh, planetary robotics uh, and mobility systems and basically like rover operations for, uh, for, for surface missions. Um, and in a prior life, I, uh, I was a systems engineer at the European Space Agency doing a concept study um, and early development on a uh, lunar orbiter mission. So I've, uh, I've looked at the moon from uh, not quite uh, the, the science lens, but uh, for, for, these, uh, for these missions, uh, even when you're looking through the engineering lens, there's always a, a scientific intention uh, behind, uh, behind those, uh, uh, those missions. Um, and uh, now I'm uh, a, a systems engineer at uh, Mission Control Space Services here in Ottawa. Um, and I'm also an adjunct research professor uh, at Western. So you'll notice a common trend, which is we all have PhDs at Western, which would explain why we all know each other um, and would explain why uh, I was able to get everyone together for an hour to talk about uh, the moon. So. All right, so what are we doing today? The rules are, I've asked Patrick and Matt to compete against one another as moon general managers, so to speak. Now, if you're a sports fan, uh, this will be much easier of an analogy to understand. If you're not, uh, I'll, I'll try to lay it out as clearly as I possibly can. Patrick and Matt will look over the history of lunar missions. I've sent them a list of missions that are available for selection and they will pick five now if one of their if the opponent picks one of these missions the other one cannot so if Patrick picks a mission Matt cannot pick it so they will have individual distinct rosters of moon missions their objective is to collect five missions that provide as much possible information about the moon as possible however like the real world whether you're a space agency a private company or a sports team, uh, you have a spending limit. And what that does then is it limits which missions they can pick because in the list that I sent them, each mission comes with a associated cost. So I'll post that uh, table up for, so everyone can see. So when you're listening to this, you can refer to it if you'd like. Um, but as a general rule, uh, the, the more information, the, the more spectacular, uh, the more science rich the mission was, the more expensive it is. So at the highest end, we have the Apollo lunar landings, where you have in situ human operation on the surface of the moon. Um, and at the lower end, we have some very short lived missions. Um, and these are cheaper, but they did, depending on which ones they are, return some very specific or very interesting data. Um, so their objective is to stay under 100 billion fictional units of money. Um, hold on, my cat is going crazy. One sec. Hello. Uh, yeah, their objective is to stay under 100 billion <laughs> units of fictional currency. And as you can see from the mission draft rules that I've posted, uh, each mission has an associated cost. The last thing I'll say is that there are missions that are not included on the list. If Matt or Patrick would like to select one, Matt's already smiling, and I think I know what he's going to do. Um, those are only those only cost five fictional billion units. Um, so is everyone clear on the rules? Zach, are yes. you clear? so Zach's role in all of this is at the end. 
Matt and Patrick will each have a roster of five historical lunar missions. And Zach's role is to look at those lists and imagine a world where those were the only five lunar missions ever. Which world would know more about the moon? So it's a hypothetical scenario. Obviously, there's a lot of suspension of disbelief required here, uh, as you'll see in the lectures that, it, as, that go along with this podcast. Uh, a lot of these missions build off of what the missions before them did, so it would be hard to have some of these without the other ones, uh, particularly some of the orbiters and some of the more modern missions. But uh, for the sake of some fun, for the sake of running down some of these missions, uh, we're going to ignore that, and we're just going to think of these missions as individual things. Um, so if there's no questions or comments, no rule clarifications required from the teams? Nope. Okay, so I think we had agreed we would flip a coin to see who drafted first. I don't know if I have a coin. Does anyone have a coin? I can go yes. get one. I got one. But it might not be impartial if I do it. How's well, that's impartial? I'm the judge. That's what I'm here for. I have in my possession a Canadian toonie, even though I'm not oh, in wow. Canada. Mm -hmm. There you go. How do you flip a coin over Zoom? Do you just call uh, it when it's in the air? I mean, it doesn't have to because they can't see it. So why don't you... That was a good point. And Zach will just say what it was. Or will be. Heads. Patrick has chosen heads. It was indeed heads. Whoa! <laughs> okay. So I need to get some paper to keep track of this. I probably won't end up using video. I feel like it's going to hamper uh, the discussion more than help it. So I'll probably just turn this into an audio podcast, which is probably the easiest. As a disclaimer, I will say, oh, am I? Yes. Uh, while I am friends with both Doctors Hill and Cross, uh, I believe that I'm equally friends with both and that I will be an impartial judge uh, going only by the science and the presentations that may or may not sway my decision. The concluding statements. Indeed. Which I have, yeah. I have lots of hand gestures, waving, pointing, explaining why the other mission, uh, the team sucks. That's if anyone has a PowerPoint pre-drafted or would be willing to do <laughs> sketches, illustrations, that those would be worth bonus points in my consideration. Not for the benefit of the podcast, but just for the benefit of Zach. Yeah, just for me. If you want to win this fictional contest. I could have a prize. You... Yeah, here. For all humankind, available now on Amazon. If I'm not using the video, it's not as funny as a joke. But um, Okay, so Patrick has won first selection. Um... Can I propose a trade? <laughs> <laughs> Can I trade up? Uh, well, it's tough to trade up in a two-person draft. Yeah, I know. You could it's all right. Trade, it's all right. You could trade two and three for one, but... Um, I'm okay. I'm okay. So I've actually, before you pick your first, I've been curious. I actually didn't think about this in terms of, like, what would I do? And in hindsight, I could have been a participant as well with Zach as a judge, but I did make the rules, which... Is always a little shady when you participate in a game that you designed. Um, I'm also saying now I'm excited to see if particularly Matt has identified any flaws in the design or structure of the game in which there is some sort of loophole to be exploited, um, which is certainly possible, And but we shall see. Um, okay, Patrick, you're on the clock. What is your choice? So the first mission I wanted was was from a tactical side. I would like the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Mm. Um, Choice. It, to me, it is one of the best orbital missions. It has 98% coverage. Uh, so you got that global perspective that, you know, is going to contextualize all the other missions that I chose. So I'm going to put 25 mil, bill, billion, is it billion? Billion fictional, billion units. Uh, down, and I'm going to pick up my old 
LRO with my whack and my NAT cameras. Yeah, you you with that, you, you also get a cosmic ray telescope. I do, yeah. Yeah. And temperature diviner. Yes. So you get the the, the full temperature map. There you go. Right. So might be helpful for figuring out where to land and not melt and or freeze. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, you get Lola, you get a laser altimeter. Topography, I get imagery. Uh, there's a little multispectral with WAC capabilities. It has certain bands it can do, but it's more complementary to other missions and self, you know, standalone. As a neutron spectrometer to help with water, as well as lamp, which is another water searching for. So I feel like Which I got one? some some intense water activities, but also just good geologic context for mapping those large impact basins that everybody likes to map the ejector of. <laughs> so you, you also get, yeah, 50 centimeter resolution. Um, and if I want to go back, I want to know where to land and if there's many hazards and stuff like that. And I can do mission planning for the future. That's if I was to do that. That's what, that's, your society is off to a good start, Patrick. Um, what was I going to... Okay, so Patrick has spent 25. He has 75 remaining. Let's go. Ba -ba -ba -ba. Second overall, Dr. Cross, you're on the clock. All right. Um, so I'm just going to my, uh, my draft table and deleting an entire column. <laughs> um, <laughs> as that is no longer relevant. Uh, so for, um, for my first pick, uh, second overall, I am selecting uh, Chandrayaan-2. Um, so Chandrayaan is a newer uh, uh, lunar orbiter and has a higher resolution camera compared, to, uh, compared to LRO, um, even though it has not yet been in operation uh, for quite as long. Uh, it is uh, more detailed surface imagery. Um, and it also includes uh, spectral imaging uh, and terrain modeling. And so not only do we have the, the highest resolution surface imagery um, and the spectral uh, data to go along with it, uh, we can also develop terrain maps, uh, which are also useful for um, you know, plotting out potential future landing sites uh, and and traverse paths to the even you know, like an even higher uh, level of resolution compared to LRO, uh, and so this mission clocks in at uh, fifteen. Uh, so I'm feeling okay. Yeah, come talk to me when you get ninety eight percent coverage of the moon's surface, man. <laughs> Give it time. You Give it time. So, and this is, this brings up an interesting point that we might want to discuss. So these fictional societies that are drafting, um, Patrick has selected a mission that has been functioning essentially perfectly for over 10 years, whereas Matt has chosen a mission that has been functioning for two years and nothing has gone wrong or anything and the full expectations that Chandrayaan 2 will meet out its mission. But um, I guess our assumption is that when you draft the mission, you get its historical findings with it which is mm -hmm. make LRO so much more valuable right now than Chandrayaan-2. Now, that's not to say Chandrayaan, if Chandrayaan operated for 10 plus years, we might be phenomenal findings, and certainly there will be that global coverage at 50 centimeters or 30 centimeters. Mm -hmm. so, 30 centimeter per pixel. So Patrick has inherited a much richer scientific library at the moment and a fully capable spacecraft. Matt has selected a younger, perhaps riskier spacecraft, uh, given that it's a, a space agency that hasn't operated as much at the moon, as much as NASA. Um, but something that has certainly the potential to... I, I, I believe in, uh, in, in, in parlance, it's, we, we would call it a higher upside. Yes, yes. Now, let us remember what happened to the lander that was going with Chandrayaan too. Oh, that, that uh, again, I'm not, I'm not, I didn't draft that part. <laughs> yes. Well, I only drafted the, the orbiter. The Vikram lander, which went with Chandrayaan too, did not land successfully. Um, but as all spacefaring nations do, uh, there are 
failures along the way, and that's part of the deal. So, all right, Matt has spent 15. Both have selected orbiters. Um, and uh, that may be an indication of the value of these long-term orbiting spacecraft. So Patrick, the floor is back to you. Great, excellent. So with my next choice, I am going to choose a Apollo mission and I am gonna choose Apollo 16, which is 50 billion. So I've already spent a a 75 percent of my budget. <laughs> okay, um, interesting. Um, but you did sixteen, I, I did. The part of the reason is because I really like sixteen. It's one of the few missions that sampled furthest away from all that Mari, that dark stuff on the moon. So we have some Highland stuff, and we can get a sort of understanding of the uh, anorphosite crust and the early processes on the moon. Um, ideally, I would have wanted to go with, uh, I did really like 17. Uh, 17 has a lot of volcanic glasses, which give us insight into the inside of the moon, but that's just too pricey for this budget. <laughs> so for those maybe not looking at the score sheet, I priced Apollo 17 five units higher Part of my reasoning was that there's also a geologist on board Apollo 17. It was having yeah. a geologist on the ground on the moon is worth an extra amount of units. Um, and also, in terms, of if you think about it within game mechanics, you would have you now have to train a geologist to become an astronaut, which costs a little bit more than training a, an astronaut to be an astronaut. Um, okay, Patrick. So you've dropped a huge amount of your salary cap. Uh, mm -hmm. to Apollo 16, but you do get, you, you get a, a large amount of lunar materials. About 96 kilos. Yes. So as we'll see with some of the other, depending on how Dr. Cross decides whether he wants samples or how he wants samples, we will see just how much more in orders of magnitude the Apollo missions brought back compared to anything robotic. Uh, part of the reason is that the Apollo spacecraft was quite large. And they had people that were able to just grab rocks and throw them in sacks, essentially. Um, so, okay, so Patrick has uh, fired a pretty significant shot in terms of sample return. And if we look at where he's landed, I just want to see, I want to pull up Apollo 16. So, okay, obviously on the near side, near the equator-ish. Uh, mm -hmm. the Apollo missions. Um, right. And though it doesn't sample those basalts, you probably would get pieces of basalts in uh, the regolith just because of the way the lunar regolith mixes due to impacts and ejecta. Uh, but it's mostly a highland target or, or an orthosite, as we call it, the white stuff of the moon. All right, let's let's go to Dr. Cross and see how he responds to this. Uh, so I would have thought uh, Patrick would have selected Apollo 15 uh, mm -hmm. for the creep basalts, mm. which would be related to the uh, the the Theia theory. At least that's my understanding of creep basalts <laughs> and Theia. <laughs> there is a component, but it's more. Uh, a result of um, how the crust formed in the moon. But it's important to know that within the ejector, because of all, where all the Apollo landing sites are on the near side, practically all of them have some creepy component, as we call it. So you can't really, you can, you get a lot of it at, at Apollo 15, like you said, but uh, it's 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 it would contaminate everything technically. So for fourth overall, my my second selection, I am uh, going with the uh, the Celine mission, or specifically the Ooh. Cayuga mm. orbiter. Um, so this uh, this pr provides another suite. Of, of imaging and spectrometers and uh, and laser altimetry, 
Um, and so it's just to increase and you know provide you know an, an additional set of uh, orbital orbital based data to complement uh, the small but growing uh, uh, collection of orb orbital data from the uh, Chandrayaan two mission. All right, all right. So a few things there. Um, yeah, high high definition uh, camera, actually fluorescence, molecular magnetometer, spectral profiler. Uh, multiband imager, laser altimeter, you know, radar sounder, gamma ray spectrometer, charged particle spectrometer, plasma analyzer, upper atmosphere and plasma imager. So a ton. The uh, Kaguya was a stacked mission. Uh, didn't operate for a long time, 2007, 2009, the Japanese orbiter, um, but a very unique data set in some ways and uh, earlier than LRO, um, kind of a forgotten lunar orbiter sometimes. Um, so that was only another 15 units. So Matt is, is perhaps spending to the floor this year in an effort to rebuild, but, uh, he's only at 30 so far. Um, we're, we're four missions in, I'll note Matt's team is much more international. We have Japan, <laughs> India, whereas Patrick is sticking with the Americans, the tried and true. Um, Zach, speaking of Americans. What do you what are you thinking so far is what you're seeing? I think this is a tight race. This is a, this is a strong draft. The 2021 uh, lunar mission draft is is one for the books. Um, <laughs> it's really hard to say. I think these last three missions are going to set these two teams apart. Uh, as of right now, I have a few notes, but I don't want to share too much no, no, no. my yeah. thoughts and don't want to influence the the remainder of the picks. So uh, I will chime in more as we go. But right, I'm really so you... excited to see where these two teams end. <laughs> Your bland, uh, like athlete slash scientist slash public servant response is spot on. Like that, that was the perfect not answer to a question, which, uh, yeah, very well done. Um, okay. So I think we're right back to Patrick yep. who is working with a 25 billion unit remaining, uh, budget. Yep. So, Patrick. What so, the next pick for me is going international, as I've been criticized already, uh, <laughs> was Sh Sh Chandrayaan 1 for oh. 10 billion. Yeah. Um, so, I, I alluded to it with my first pick in that LRO did have some multi spectral capacity, but it wasn't super, super intense. It was meant to look for some olivine which is uh, deep material and stuff like that. But Chandrayaan has a really great spectral package. Um, it's the M cubed um, uh, instrument, which is actually designed out of Brown University and JPL, uh, but is a really great spectrometer for identifying different mineral phases. Uh, for example, if we wanted to go find some of that olivine, because that's deep mantle material, so we want to get this material that we can't just access on the surface, uh, we'll have to go hunt for it. So we would want to do that. You got some uh, a mini uh, SAR, and Chandrian also did some really great stuff for looking for water and things like that. I believe it also had an impact probe, but I don't know how that, that went. Um, but that's always I think fun. It, I think it litho braked. Oh. Well, I mean, that would have been the intention from the start as <laughs> an impact probe. Yeah, I've never seen any science out of it. Um, and I don't know that they caught a plume the same way that... Uh, Hell cross. But uh, that's a good question. I've never heard much about it. Actually, when I was writing up the details in Chandra and when I didn't remember them having an impact at all. Well, they... <laughs> I was reading and some article claimed that because Chandrayaan, what the impact probe had the Indian flag on it, mm. smashing it into the surface might have counted as placing a flag on the surface of the moon, making it the fourth country. Uh, but I don't know if, if, if that would carry if in terms of flag placing, because it's not quite the same as you know, gently raising your flag on the surface. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Did, I guess the question, did the flag survive the impact? 
and like mm. obviously it wouldn't be standing after and i feel yeah. like the thing with flags based on what i know about flags is that they're like erect and waving yeah and i don't know if it was an impact or if a soft landing so i guess if it was a soft, landing, it was a it soft landing no neither did i so i think that doesn't count but anyway yeah i, I chose it mostly for its spectrometer it also had xrf fluorescence so that would tell mm -hmm. us other elements um as well as uh, a small hyperspectral capability as well as additional laser ranging but i already had that with lro but you got some backup five meter resolution imagery as well mm -hmm. uh, it's also good to know that you know like these high resolution cameras low lro is global coverage that's mostly the it's not the hyper yeah. the high resolution imagery at that right so more imagery the better all right so you've 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 selected two orbiters and a human landing and you've got 15 units left mm -hmm. let's head back over to your opponent dr cross what do you got uh what i have is some warm comfort knowing that had i been able to select first uh, overall uh <laughs> our my picks would have lined up with Patrick's. So oh. <laughs> I, oh. I, I'm glad that my, my 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 picks are aligning with the uh, the lunar science. Sign but doesn't that yeah. mean that so so far every pick you've made has been your second choice for that slot? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So yeah, I I had some I got an ex you know my my draft table different different scenarios depending on how I thought Patrick would uh, approach it. So um, so for my third selection um, and sixth other overall, uh, I am drafting uh, the Chang'e 4 mission uh, with the lander on the far side of the moon. Yeah. And so, you know, selected for um you know for for one practical reason i like robots i like uh mobile robotic systems and uh and chonga 4 what you know has been a, a successful uh lunar uh, robotic mission um and uh what, what's valuable about having uh surface assets is you know particularly as equipped as uh, as this rover with uh, both you know, you know imagery and and uh, and uh, and IR spectroscopy is you can uh, sort of compare and ground truth the orbital data, and so um, you know it's great to have you know all these like loads of like really good um, uh, of orbital uh, data sets. Um, but what's even more powerful is when you can actually be on the surface where the robotic asset. And uh, and do mo a more you know proximal um, uh, assessment, and so that gives greater confidence to your uh, your 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 orbital data sets, and so uh, and also for uh, for you know technology reasons uh, it does does show that um, you know it can you know pave the, the way for future uh, robotic missions, um, and which you know I think I, I'm an advocate for. And uh, and also to the it's to the you know, the far side uh, of the moon, uh, whereas previous uh, landed missions were uh, were on the near side. So I just think it's a, a it's a it's a fun one. It's it's a bit of a steal. It's the only far side mission. It's the only in situ far side data that's available in the entire draft. Uh, so that's that's a pretty big deal. Um, and obviously with your orbiters, you'll have imagery of the far side, uh, and now you'll be able to at least see what some of that material is compared to your orbital data. Uh, keeping with your international theme as well, you haven't selected two uh, missions from the same country yet. You also have not approached North America or Europe. I believe now we go back to Patrick. Woo! So for my fourth pick, I am going to leave the international and come back to America. <laughs> there you're going to say leave the moon. <laughs> Nope. Curiosity. Nope. Just going, going back to <laughs> America. Uh, and I'm actually going to go with Grail for another 10. Uh, 
So Grail is a gravity um, mission. It's actually technically two orbiters, Grail A and Grail B. Uh, they were little satellites that were following each other, uh, and they went into orbit around the moon, and, and basically they were measuring the the grav uh, gravity anomalies. So if they went over something really massive, it sped up one of the the orbiting devices, and there was a lag, and they could, based on the separation between the two orbiting platforms, they could get a sense of gravity anomalies and stuff. But the reason I chose this, this isn't really my area of expertise, but it's more geophysics. But geophysics really allows us to see inside the planetary body. And so with Apollo 16, they had seismometers, so we could see some probably uh, interior features such as uh, moonquakes, uh, and you can get a rough sense of the size of the moon's core, uh, but it was a bit hand wavy. It's not, they weren't the best instruments um, compared to modern equivalent seismometers. Uh, but Grail really helped with that. So it's a really, without digging, is a way you can probe the subsurface. So you can look at the thickness of the crust, uh, impact base and structures, uh, mag uh, magnetism, and things like that, as well as. Uh, Limit, limits on the moon's core including its inner core so just you know you got to have a holistic view of 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 your planetary bodies you see it inside um, now and uh grail is one way to do that saying that uh i believe chandria and also uh, not chandria and uh, changa had a ground penetrating radar which you didn't mention so at least you are also seeing a little bit of the subsurface but not quite as deep not 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 much no, oh, and what's, just, uh, just a couple of tens of meters. Just, yeah, not not very much of it. Yeah, the there and there's some some like really interesting uh, subsurface modeling uh, being done with that great grail data to to yeah identify lunar lava tubes and mm -hmm. uh, which which helps um, uh, in, you know improve uh, hypotheses on non lunar, lunar volcanism and so yeah. Y y Who's a good, that, that, a good... that would have been my that would have been my fourth pick as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have a run on unique missions, just the two of them. But we have the only far side mission, and then we have the only real gravity mapping mission. Uh, so Patrick gets a highly detailed, uh, well, certainly there's nothing to compare it to, but a detailed gravity map of the moon. Uh, essentially, yeah, those two spacecraft were doing a form of gravity trigonometry as they flew, uh, and as one of them was perturbed and the other wasn't, they just measured that relative change between the two spacecraft and that gave them a sense of what was underneath. Uh, we have a similar mission in Earth orbit called GRACE and that's where the instruments came from. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, it, it's actually unique to the solar system. There hasn't been that detailed gravity mapping anywhere. So um, very good choice, Dr. Hill. Woo. <laughs> um, at least in my opinion. So that brings us to eighth overall back to dr cross so my preference uh would have been 16 uh but in a effort to get a large volume and collection of return samples i am picking apollo 15. good choice so that was one. Partly because I cannot afford 17. Mm. Yeah. So I was wondering if each of you would pick a human mission. Uh, and you have. So Matt, yours comes in at 50. Yeah. And I believe, I don't know if this counts or if there's any way to manipulate the, um, uh, the, the cost structure here. But wasn't 15 the one where the astronauts took stamps with them and then sold them um yes. that does a, not get you extra units no okay no okay no that was uh yep yeah they got in trouble for that actually and there was rules put into place um about that very thing um so yeah mac gets apollo 15 uh the the uh the first of the what we call the j-class apollo missions that had a rover with it uh, so you have the two astronauts driving around on the moon, covering great distances, spending upwards of 20, 
to 30 plus hours on the lunar surface. Uh, by comparison, Apollo 11 only spent, the first moon landing only spent three hours on the surface. Uh, so not a lot of time for science, not a lot of time for sample collection. Uh, it was really just about going there and, and coming back. But these later missions, especially uh, 15, 16, 17, uh, we're very focused on collecting samples, collecting samples from specific points and talking about where they were coming from and, and as best they could, documenting where they were selected from and taking pictures of them before they grabbed them. Uh, all things geologists tend to be interested in uh, and scientists in general. So Matt's got himself on the ground. Uh, well, he was already on the ground on the far side, but now he's got humans on the ground on the near side. Um, all right. And that leaves you with five units. So I think I know what you're going to do with those five units. Um, I know what I would do with those five units. But And this brings us back to Patrick, who also has five units to spend. And actually, given that he's been one step ahead of Matt the entire day, if he's doing what I think he's doing, uh, well, we'll see. Patrick, okay. your ninth overall choice. Uh, I... I'm actually just going to confirm that this is not on your list because that would be embarrassing. It's not. Okay, good. So I'm choosing the Lunar Prospector mission for oh. five bucks. Not what I had in mind, but yeah. Uh, I was debating. There was another one you left off was uh, the Clementine mission. Yep, that was the one I thought everyone would take for five. Uh, but I went with Lunar Prospector um, mainly... Uh, because of its gamma ray spectrometer that allows you to uh, look at different elements and their distribution on the surface. Uh, it was really important in highlighting the thorium concentration, which we associate with that creep terrain. Um, and so that's really what highlighted that the, there was this, this huge discrepancy between the near side and the far side. Um, I also have used gamma this gamma ray spectroscopy data to um we have lunar meteorites on earth and we can know their chemical composition and so i've used that composition and compared it to the to the surface and found places on the surface that match the chemical composition i mapped so you can get a sense of where material might be coming from the moon i uh, also looked at for some ice polar studies which i think is an important question for how volatile material moves around the inner solar system, including how did we get all the water to Earth and stuff. Uh, and if you want to mine the moon, that's going to be something that you mine. Um, so uh, the neutron spectrum is really good. Uh, I don't really, it also did some magnetic waves and gravity fields, but I don't really know too much about that. So I'm, I'm sure it was useful. <laughs> really sold it there. <laughs> I mean, you have Grail, so I, I doubt it's gravity data is better than, although I guess maybe some ground-based gravity stuff is helpful. I don't know anything about that stuff at all. Um, okay, yeah. I didn't, yeah, I figured it'd be a low-cost mission even if I put it on the list, so I thought I'd leave it in the, in the bonuses extras category. Mm -hmm. um, all right, then you've spent your full 100 years, and you have five missions. So it is up to Dr. Cross now to choose his last <laughs> off the board category. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, for, for keeping track at home, Pat Patrick's draft <laughs> slate went with that was the same one I had. So I feel good. <laughs> I feel good knowing that I had my, my preferred uh, suite of five missions aligned with the lunar. But, but you don't want to. You don't want to affect Zachary's thinking right now. And oh no, I'm like, I'm trying to, I'm trying to see how. Yeah, I have many options for for going off the board, and I'm trying to think of like what's the what's really going to to lock lock it down for me. Uh, well, I mean, you could speak to his sense of national identity and pick like one of their greatest triumphs ever, Apollo 13. It would do nothing for you scientifically. It, it does get pictures. It does get pictures. It does go. Apollo 13 does provide. So I, I I'll, I'll go through, <laughs> like, I think I know which one I'm going to, I'm going to select, but I'm, okay. I want to just for the, you know, cause this is education. Educational. I, Educational. Uh, I do want to go through some of the, some of the, the other uh, ones yep. I, I considered. Uh, so there is, uh, so Apollo 13, they got pictures of the far side. Uh, Good movie Attica, too. 
and there's you get, great your your civilization gets the accompanying movie which then inspires more children like Zachary Morse to go into lunar science, which means your society is, has better high quality personnel. As we talk. That's true, that is true. Um, th another option, um, so in, in, in the event that I was not able to, to select uh, in uh, one of the previous orbiters with a laser altimeter, uh, the Chang'e 2 uh, orbiter, uh, would have fulfilled my laser altimeter mission or data needs. Uh, so that, uh, that came, comes in at five. Um, uh, the, uh, you know, if we, you know, to go with, uh, the, you know, as broad of, uh, a, a, an international and diverse, uh, crowd, I, I had considered the smart one mission, uh, which was ESA's, uh, mm. lunar orbiter mission. Um, and that had, uh, you know, an you know, X-ray and IR spectrometers uh, for mineral identification, and it's also an interesting technology demonstration in that, uh, whereas most other lunar missions use a traditional chemical propulsion system to to, uh, to transit from Earth to Moon, uh, Smart One used an electric propulsion system, and so this was one of the earlier demonstrations of electric propulsion, uh, which is a much more fuel efficient means um, uh, of, of, of going from uh, you know one orbit to 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 another uh, the the impact is that it's you know it's it's much slower it's to get slower there. yeah um, so this is my uh, I mean this is my final final pick let's so, look at your team here you have yeah India Japan China America so okay yeah so he, again going off the board um, maybe bending the 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 category a little but okay this mission did in fact acquire lunar surface images and you know, pictures of the moon okay <laughs> on its way to jupiter right I'm selecting <laughs> galileo because <laughs> the study of jupiter uh, helps constrain and, and inform the overall solar system formation. And one of the reasons why we're interested in studying the moon and, you know, is how the solar system uh, formed, how the moon formed. And so, you know, getting, gaining knowledge of other solar system uh, bodies does help feed into the overall model for solar system formation. So for okay. my final pick, I'm locking in. Galileo. Galileo mission. He did take pictures of the moon on right. Wait, and it so it did test out some of its instruments, uh, the 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 camera as 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 well as the uh, I believe it was um, uh, one of the mosaic cameras as well. Uh, tested it. Okay, on. so a few points of, of clarification here, as as Matt has gone off the board, which is fair, um, but but let's remember the parameters of of the judgment, Doctor Morris is understanding of the moon. So Matt has made a good case that Galileo would contribute to understanding of the moon. However, I don't think you should take into account knowledge of Jupiter into... So, so their societies do have other solar system things, hypothetically. So, so Matt shouldn't win on the very obvious advantage of also knowing about other planets. <laughs> Which, which Patrick's society apparently does not know about any other planets. Um, so very good choice, uh, Dr. Cross, Galileo, a, a very good Jupiter mission, had a pretty significant failure with its high gain antenna, so it wasn't able to send back uh, the Jupiter images it intended to. It sent back like 5% of what it was designed to do, but still very cool stuff um, and took very nice images and redefined, speaking of moons, uh, our understanding of the four Galilean moons. We hadn't had close-up images like that, uh, even since Voyager. So, um, all right, so that rounds out uh, Dr. Cross's team. Certainly an eclectic squad, a, 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 uh, a, a motley crew, if there ever were one. We have Chandrayaan-2, Kaguya, Chang'e-4, Apollo-15, and Galileo. Um, all right, let me just put that into the list. 
is the 10th overall pick. This is akin to, I believe it was the Florida Panthers trying to draft Alexander Ovechkin the year before he was eligible, uh, arguing that had his birthday been two days later, he would be eligible. And that by international... I am referring... So this is inspired by the Canucks' successful drafting of Pavel Bure. Pavel Bure, yes, yes. Well, you you drafted much better than uh, your favorite team's own GM, uh, who would have showed up with a coloring book and just listed names. Um, all right, Zachary. Uh, well, first, I'll run down uh, the 10 missions that were selected. First overall was the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, a NASA orbiter from 2008 to now. Uh, so first overall pick, I kind of... That was my initial assumption when I was doing like, oh, what should be the most expensive that isn't an Apollo mission? But in terms of what would go first, I was wondering what you guys would do. Uh, I guess no one Apollo mission is so much better than the others that you'd need to grab it right away. And I suspect the logic was, well, if he grabs 16, I'll grab 15. It's not a big... Because no one, no one can grab two, really. Mm -hmm. you can exactly. Only, yeah. So essentially, you're going to only get one in this exercise and yeah they're mostly interchangeable i wondered if someone would go with the cheap option of apollo 11 relatively cheap for a human mission you still get i don't know exactly how many kilograms of lunar material certainly much more than any robotic mission uh but far short of like the almost 100 kilograms that the later missions were bringing back i think it's 22 kilograms from apollo 11. Uh, so still a good load of lunar material not very well documented. <laughs> I think Neil and Buzz were literally just shoving it in boxes in their pockets. Um, but yeah, that ended up not happening. Uh, second overall, I think was a strategic choice, although I wondered. So Matt, you took Chandrayaan 2. I think that was to cover your orbital requirements. But I, it's interesting because I don't think Patrick would take, like no one would take two very good orbiters. Maybe they would. I don't know. Um, and then it went to Apollo 16 out of Patrick, who pulled the first Apollo trigger. And then Matt went with the relatively unique and somewhat forgotten Kaguya, Japanese orbiter. Patrick came back with Chandrayaan 1, uh, which did do a lot of the earliest imaging and mapping. Well, maybe not mapping, but imaging and detecting of volatiles on the moon. Uh, and then Matt came back with Chang'e 4, the far side lander. So big, unique score there in terms of having a far side uh, asset on the ground. Uh, Patrick came back with his own unique mission, Grail, uh, the only high definition, well, high, I don't know if there's a standard for high definition gravity, but high quality gravity map of the moon. And Pat, then Zach, or sorry, wow, uh, Matt, pulled his Apollo trigger and went with Apollo 15. So the other J-class mission that wasn't very expensive. Um, uh, so Apollo 15 and 16 were both 50 units. Uh, Apollo 17 was five more, as I said, because there was a scientist on board. Uh, and then Patrick closed out with a cheap option at Lunar Prospector, a kind of short, somewhat experimental mission uh, that did get on the ground, though. Uh, and does give Patrick a robotic asset on the surface. And then Matt uh, went way off the board, selecting Galileo, the Juner, <laughs> Juno, the Jupiter orbiter, uh, which orbited, uh, imaged both Jupiter and uh, its Galilean moons. Um, and as Dr. Cross noted, did collect images of, of the moon, probably for calibration purposes. Yep. <laughs> but, you know, images nonetheless. Uh, which will also help Matt's lunar geologists in Matt's society constrain some age ranges and other things in the formation of the solar system that Jupiter might play a role in. So I've summarized the choices. It's time for the two of you to make your closing arguments um, because Patrick went, went first. I will let Matt choose whether he'd like to go first with closing arguments or second. Uh, I choose to go second. All right. So Matt, so Patrick had first overall choice. He now has to provide his concluding arguments first. 
Great. So uh, I chose some five terrific options uh, because I wanted to get a really complete picture of the moon. Um, as was sort of mentioned, ideally you would want more Apollo missions, but it was too costly to do that. Uh, so what I did instead was complement one Apollo mission with a really global understanding of the moon so that you can contextualize it. So we had Apollo 16, which had some highland materials, uh, what makes up most of the surface, uh, some great seismic data there, a lot of raw, uh, material to come back to study, to look at answering questions of how did the moon form, how did its crust evolve, things like that. Um, then you had the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, which is that first piece in making that global picture, is that you have to have good global coverage of visible imagery, uh, as well as uh, topography, uh, and also looking for some volatiles as well. It also has a fun little radar, so which you can use to get different properties of rocks on the surface and things like that. Uh, that's also super important if you want to go back to the moon. Um, which I believe was one of the motivations for it was that it was in that period where they were talking about going back to the moon with constellation, if I'm not mistaken, and it would help with planning. And I believe it certainly will moving forward. Uh, then I chose Chandrayaan 1 because while the LRO is a really awesome orbiter, uh, uh, spectrally it does have some limitations uh, and that really complements it nicely. The M cube matter mapper would really uh, pick up different phases of interest that we would be interested as geologists uh, and where those might be outcropping once again in case you want to go back to the moon but also that global picture and it also really did help with some of that volatile question as you mentioned which is a, an important question not just for the moon because we did think it was dry based on the Apollo program but also how does volatile material move about in the solar system from the creation of the solar system to the present day. Um, all of those missions really help look at the surface and understand those processes. So that's why I chose GRAIL to go deeper into the surface and try and get some subsurface information. Uh, I believe there's a strong motivation for a, a better geophysical network on the ground, but really GRAIL is the foremost and best geophysical survey of a planetary body we really have to date. Um, I, I suppose um, Mars now has a, a geophysical probe which might make it better, but I think Grail is one of a kind and really, really unique. And then with my five remaining points, I chose Lunar Prospector another sort of orbiter to get a sense of the distribution of some of these elements that might have been missed. Also look at particularly forum, Forium, which really highlighted uh, this really chemical difference between the near side and the far side um, and was detected based on that, uh, as well as looking for some more water ice and answering that question. So yeah, I feel like my mission combines, you got some rocks, which you can do your ground truth thing to, woo, but all the orbital missions really provide a nice overall global picture of the moon that would be really beneficial as we look to return to the moon, but also understand it in its current state. And I chose a lot of America missions because America's super cool, super cool country. You are, I don't know what the, like, you know how there's those legal terms like leading the witness, badgering. There's probably a term for like sucking up to the jury, and that's what that is. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I, f I think I'm just stating facts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I uh, I misspoke. I don't know why I thought Luna Prospector had a landing asset with it. It, it was just an orbiter, but um, Prospector sounds like you know, something that'd be on the ground. But. Prospecting for gold. <laughs> Mine that gold out of... The, out uh, as, of the as a lunar geologist, can you answer the question? Is there gold on the moon? There's not very much. <laughs> well, that's probably... Still Based enough. on our evidence that we know now, watch me be wrong, that they discovered the world's largest gold deposit in South Pole, Aiken, Bakerston or something. 
but yes, to date, not really much has been detected. Mm -hmm. It's really a shame. Um, all right, We're, that puts us now for Dr. Cross's closing arguments, the closing arguments of the trial. Uh, there's probably a name for that as well, like the, the ultimate closing argument. Wait, so are we, a, are, are we drafting or is this like a... <laughs> I don't know. On trial. Please. Zach's a judge. I think so we it's, it's a draft and a, a the genre here. Um, it's a trial. So, so I uh, so I uh, I approach this um, you know through through a slightly different lens. Um, you know, thinking about um, the you know what what what's somewhat uh, you know amusing. Uh, to you know, in, in, you know, for me is you know, in, in my selection of missions, the the oldest mission is the one in which we have you know, humans on the surface, and the most recent ones are the orbiters. Um, wh whereas you know, when thinking about mission planning and 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 how would you conduct an investigation of a uh, of a planetary uh, body, uh, you know, including the moon, uh, you, one would start with uh, gathering. Uh, a large volume of, of, of orbital data. Um, so between the the older uh, Selene mission, uh, as well as the more uh, the, the current uh, Chandrayaan two mission, uh, there's a, a a suite of uh, diverse instruments uh, to that is you know captured a wide array of uh, of scientific data on the lunar surface, um, as well as the uh, the highest resolution images we have uh, from uh, from an orbiting platform, and this all helps feed to uh, support uh, future missions in which we would uh, then uh, attempt to, to land on the surface uh, and conduct surface exploration with robotic assets. And so I've incorporated that into my into my mission suite, the the, the Chang Four mission, um, which. Uh, with as as a robotic asset on the surface is able to perform some of that ground truthing activity. Um, so comparing its uh, its instrument suite and the data it collects to that or that that uh, that orbital data, and somewhat unique in that um, it, you know, it's doing this on the far side of the moon, um, whereas my landed mission uh, is on is on the near side. Uh, but in the in the sort of the progression of um, uh, of surface exploration uh, you know, from orbit to robotic assets, and one could argue that you could stop there. Uh, but then the the next stage would would be to then return samples from from the surface, and and so um, uh, you know, having the Apollo mission on the near side of the moon returning a large collection of of samples. Now this would be significantly more volume and mass than than a robotic uh, sample return mission that that we would envision. Um, but the the, the Apollo um, the Apollo mission uh, was able to retrieve large volumes and masses of, of rocks that uh, that are you know, can still be uh, used and studied today, um, including um, those those creek basalts that that Patrick Patrick should I, I really thought Patrick would, would go for the creek basalts um, so that was an error on my my part. Um, and uh, and so this is you, you kind of, again. I'm looking at through like a mission planning and, and and technological progression, orbiting, collecting lots of data, landing on the surface, ground truthing, and then returning uh, returning samples. Now again, my actual missions I, I've selected do this in the reverse order, uh, which is not that's fine. That's just how history works. Um, and then thinking outside the box, going off the board. Um, using, you know, you, you collecting data. It's one thing to, you know, you can study and investigate a particular body, but you, if you want to place it in context with within the, the, the larger solar system, it's great to, great to study other, other planets too. <laughs> that, I don't, I don't, I mean, Zach can make of that what he a, That's a classic NASA mission, Galileo classic. <laughs> Don't so much so much 
what we call pathos. In, in and and also and and like thinking about you, know, um, you, you you know the the moon should be for all humankind. And yeah. I've tried to incorporate uh, you know a diverse collection um, of, uh, of of nations and uh, and agencies uh, who are working together. Uh, you know, in the global context, where right? how do we have a, achieve a global uh, understanding of our of our nearest nearest? And I think Galileo had this uh, involvement, right? That was Cassini. Galileo purely NASA. I believe so. It seems. Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, but, but, you know, Galilei Galileo was European. So you have, have in a way hit Europe. Um, Patrick is yes, all America. And then, um, uh, in honor of his grandfather, I suspect. <laughs> with a large, with a large contingent of U.S. payloads. <laughs> Yes. yes, I did choose it mainly for the U.S. payload that was included. So, because it's such an awesome country, <laughs> especially West Virginia, <laughs> what a beautiful state. Um, yeah, I mean they they do it the best. I think <laughs> they just have the biggest budget. It's more of the the product of the times. But I suppose we could have gone with a Soviet mission, and neither of us went with a Soviet mission. No, nope. no one took uh, some very cheap sample return, get a few grains with Luna 17, uh, not 17, 16. I did consider, uh, yeah. but it, it was the it was the volume of, of the return that I was going going. For. Yes, yes, but for only ten units, you get you get material. So. Uh, yeah, the Luna cards, not a lot of value there now. Um, although you get ground, other than Chang'e Five, you get ground movement. Uh, but I guess distance. You get you get a significant distance. We which... do get a significant distance, which I guess the Apollo missions could also cover. Um, yeah, but lunar roving vehicle gets you get you around. Um, Zach, have you? Uh, did you want to make any? observations if you made your choice would you like to ask any questions i have several observations okay but i will say that this entire time it's been quiet here and there's about to be a train going by so we may want to like pause my deliberations for just a moment uh mm -hmm. to while it goes um my first observation though i'm surprised no one picked ranger 3 the 1962 <laughs> yeah we're gonna have to I would, so while, while Zach is on mute, I would like to note that Chang'e 4 was a rover, uh, not uh, not just a lander. Yeah. 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 So we got, we got some distance covered with... Uh, how, how much distance? Um, oh, go on. I mean, it, no Lunacod, but... <laughs> um, interesting that Matt was, or Zach was going all the way back to the Ranger program. I didn't even... Well, no, I was just saying, I was surprised no one picked Ranger 3, the 1962 mission, which uh, famously missed the moon. It did not, uh, it, it failed to uh, get there, and so completely missed, didn't even return the images. Um, so that could have been an asset uh, for someone. No one picked it. Heliocentric um, orbit. He could have been yeah. floating around the sun somewhere. Yeah. I think um, I, also missed missed its intended target of the moon there's but, a learning curve which yeah. actually factors into some of my judgment uh later um but i did want to also bring up uh that i believe you had mentioned something about how you thought lunar prospector had a ground component and there was a proposed mission called resource prospector uh, mm. which was intended to be a lunar rover uh sort of it, it was tossed around for a bit and then didn't actually happen but part of that concept has been folded into the viper mission which will be headed to South Pole, a landing site near Nobile Crater, in 2023, I believe. Um, I assume I didn't see the rules or the list of, of potential missions before this, but proposed or future missions were not allowed. So no, no Artemis, no Viper, none of, the, none of the new things. Okay. No, I think it's just too, it's 
too unknown. I, I mean, my general rule of thumb with space is until I see it in space, I don't count it as a mission just because too many things come and go that never happen. Fair enough. Well, I have a decision and it was not easy because both teams <laughs> put up a good fight. This is a strong draft. The 2021 Lunar Mission draft was, uh, again, one for the record books. Here comes the management um, speech. And yeah. Uh, there's now a second train going by at the same time as the first train. So there's even more noise. I apologize for the background, but that can't stop the truth, which is that uh, all of these choices are good. You can't, on some level, you can't necessarily rank missions because every bit of exploration is important. Um, oh. That being said, I'm now about to rank several <laughs> missions because uh, not all missions uh, generate the same amount of data. And I think it comes down to the goals of these hypothetical nations with these hypothetical budgets. And it's, society, it's a, it's a post-national world. Really okay, post-national society, a collective <laughs> uh, bound together by the intention for exploration. If the stated goal had been to explore the moon or learn how to explore the moon and other planets, Dr. Cross would have pulled out because of the variety of missions. He has orbiters, lander, and rover, and crewed mission to the surface. But since the stipulation was return the most data or to learn the most about the moon in general, Dr. Hill uh, does get my vote this time, but because the combination of the Grail mission- <laughs> Let me just win Apollo it. 16, <laughs> no, you can't just win it. I have to define why. Conditional. Apollo 16 with, the, with its uh, lunar seismometer plus GRAIL means you get uh, complementary data sets that aren't just covering the lunar surface, especially with the orbiting mission, but you get the, the lunar uh, depth, as well as the inclusion of Lunar Prospector lends to the uh, hypothetical future of your collective's uh, ability to not only explore the moon, but potentially uh, extract resources or volatiles for uh, prolonged presence on the surface, which I think um, could help you learn even more about the moon. So in this, I would say the winner of the 2021 season of Lunar Mission versus Lunar Mission uh, goes to Dr. Hill. But had, again, had the coin flipped on the other way, it would have <laughs> gone to Dr. Cross, so. We don't uh, know that, we don't know that. Well, he said that, I mean, you had said that you would have picked. Yeah, but Patrick could have adjusted on the fly. It's, yeah, it's yeah. true. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Some, some yeah, yeah I, had, I had a, had I not gotten LRO, I had a draft that included an Apollo mission and Chandrayaan 5. So, Chandrayaan 5? Or Chang'e 5? Chang'e 5. 5? Oh, yeah. I don't know why I mixed those two up. <laughs> You've gone pretty far into the future. Uh, <laughs> Chang'e 5, sorry. And Apollo 12, I have. Oh, really? Oh, 12. That was, yeah. 40. Hmm. 40 units. Um, I'm also surprised no one picked Apollo 14, uh, where Alan Shepard famously played golf on the lunar surface <laughs> and hit a couple golf balls, which would have been important for uh, gravitational tra trajectories, I guess. Um, but, and you could compare is, that to the, the Grail data afterwards. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that, could, that footage yeah. is pretty much as good as the Grail data when it comes to understanding close. gravity. There's a there's definitely a paper to be written about identifying the landing site for the two golf balls. Uh, I don't believe those mm. two landing sites have been identified to this date, and I think that that would be groundbreaking data if someone could identify the location of both golf balls from a planetary pr uh, preservation perspective as well as a gravity right. mechanics perspective. We, we also, you know, I assume we know what golf balls are made out of, and uh, they're probably buried, but their spectral signal, though minuscule. <laughs> If we get really good imagers, you never know. Um, yeah. To Matt's, um, I didn't want to give him ammunition, but in another allusion to Galileo, he chose Apollo 15, right? Yeah. Which was also the one that, that did the feather uh -huh. and, and whatever uh, else yeah. they dropped, yeah. proving Galileo was right. It was a rock hammer, a feather and yeah. a rock hammer at the same time. Yeah, and they they did it the same. They made it at the same time. Power the vacuum. Great. I'm just trying to see if there was a way to do two Apollo missions. I don't know if you guys considered it, but 
it would have almost had to have been 11 and 12, which would give you 75. And then you'd have to get the cheapest orbiter possible, because I don't think without an orbiter you could win. So you could get, well, you get Kaguya for 15. Mm -hmm. But then you only have three missions. Well, but then, you, no, you still have 10, so you could do two off. So That's true. 11, Apollo 12, Kaguya. Uh, and then two off the boards, Clementine and Lunar Prospector, or Apollo 13. I, th I still think the movie argument holds up. That's part of the mission's legacy. All right, well. But I, what's interesting is that, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, from both of our, uh, you know, me and, me and Patrick's assessment, uh, just the, the true value of having long duration orbiters yeah. being able to take vast mm -hmm. quantities of uh, of data and have that be done like rely reliably for and and send it back and have those available for uh for the the, the community to uh to study um that because it, it really is a a, a trove of uh, of lunar data that uh, that is, that we that we're still getting I was trying to look up the statistic uh, during this, and I haven't been able to find it yet, yet, but I'm fairly confident that LRO has collected a larger volume of data than all other planetary missions combined, or at least more than any other, for sure, because it has, it has such a large amount of coverage over, you know, over a decade of lunar orbiting. So, um, yes, both long-term orbiters. I sort of took Chandrayaan-2 as, as its potential versus LRO's proven track record to they yeah. almost equal each other out the presence of diviner on lro mm -hmm. helps you get a little bit of of thermal uh, information um so that edged it out a little bit but yeah those yeah. are two excellent first round picks from both teams zach any yeah, thoughts well. on what you might have picked first or or any thoughts on what your team would have looked like would you have done for sure a lander rover apollo mission orbiter I think that's how I would have I would have approached it. I would have wanted one of the J class uh, Apollo missions to get the yeah. LRV in there to get the distance covered. Uh, I definitely would have had Grail as a first yeah. or second round pick. Uh, that is such a unique data set, and it's, um, it's there's nothing else like it. And it helps us understand the interior more than just the surface, which is key if you're trying to get a holistic lunar picture. Mm. Um, so that my was actual, when I that was Patrick. Sorry? holistic i uh yeah that uh, i may have it's tough because you really need one of those long duration orbiters but uh when i first heard of this the concept of this contest grail popped into my head as like a first round pick mm. um so i may have done that and then missed an opportunity but i mean it's 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 what you, what you do you can sometimes you have a yeah. ranger three and sometimes you have a ranger four there was more economical versions of lro but like obviously matt went mm. with ground two and, and even for five, Clementine, though not great, and I'm not sure to what extent it was global, if at all, um, is still an orbiter that lasted a while. One thing that is interesting, well, I don't know, I find it interesting, is based on the structure you gave us, it wasn't really feasible to choose many Apollo missions. Hmm. And, and we each chose one uh, yeah. because of the volume, the mass that came back. But what one of the implications of not having all the Apollo or a lot of them is that it would completely affect the way that we date uh, mm -hmm. planetary surfaces throughout the solar system because they used all of the samples returned to get absolute ages. And then use, we use that to apply it to other planetary surfaces. So it would have we wouldn't have as good time scales for Mercury and the inner solar system. Uh, well, we wouldn't know that Venus's crust is super, super young as or young it is, is and Mars would be difficult because that's all press based on the suite of Apollo missions. But yeah. Yeah, I couldn't, I mean, uh, uh, yeah. I, I don't know what was, what would have been fair for Apollo, like, hmm. yeah. I mean, and, you and then I wonder if someone would have just picked Apollo missions. <laughs> if you could do three Apollo missions, you <laughs> wouldn't quite work, but you'd do close. Yeah, like you get real nerdy about and do like 
like actual budgets based on inflation to see how much Apollo was more than these missions. But mm -hmm. I think that would do Apollo even less justice. I think <laughs> you could maybe afford one then, because uh, even with inflation, uh, each mission outspends almost every other thing on this list, um, just because of the time and the blunt force approach that was taken to do it quick. Um, all right. Any closing thoughts, Dr. Cross? No. If you could pick one future mission to add to your roster, what would it be? Uh, the one you're working on. That's the correct answer. That, that would be a correct. <laughs> <laughs> Patrick? What, what uh, future mission? Um, I like the European ones. The one, um, is it called Prospector or Resource? It's a resource. It's looking, it's going to the, um, the South Pole looking for lunar resources with the Russians, I think. Um, Diaper would also be good. There could be a potential CSA one in the future based on them putting out cool calls. So it'd be fun to have a Canadian flag. Um, but I think that's a long way from a prospective. I wouldn't even call that a prospective mission. That's a, that's a dream mission. Um, yeah, I'd go for one of the European ones or uh, Viper. Um, Unfortunately, you're both wrong. The correct answer was Artemis III. Uh, so oh, right. Unfortunately, I, I'm, st I'm still waiting to see if that comes to come to to be correct answer is luna 25 mm -hmm. uh, which isa is doing with ross cosmos um and in the era of everything being nostalgic bringing back an old mission program naming is pretty sweet that'd be like if the next lunar landing was apollo 18 like that'd be pretty cool i don't know I, like I think it'll be neat when we get up to like artemis 11 artemis 13 so you have like the reference back to the original Apollo program, but the sustained human presence on the surface of the much later Artemis missions. Tom Hanks could be on, on Artemis 13. That'd be I a real call. I would go on Artemis 13. Oh. Artemis 1 and Artemis 13? No thanks. It's based on history. <laughs> All right. Um, Artemis 1 is uncrewed, though, so I think we'll be okay. Ah, smart. <laughs> Um, all right. Well, thank you, the three of you, for joining and doing this. And congratulations to Patrick on your win. Your trophy's in the mail. Um, Victory. And uh, yeah, I think in in retroact. Well, no, this is the first and only time the students will meet Dr. Morris. But in repeats of old podcasts, uh, they will meet Dr. Hill in a on the Origin of the Moon podcast. And they meet Dr. Cross in a what is now a bonus podcast on how to start a space mission, uh, which is useful for this year's final project. And whenever you're watching this, probably any future years, uh, but this this podcast would be particularly useful for this year's final project, uh, where they have to design a long-term exploration plan for a fictional nation uh, with a fake budget. So with that, thank you, everyone, and we'll see you later. Um,